Use chem power. They're the most powerful chargers. Grid serve 350 kilowatts are incredibly quick to charge. Ionity is faster than Instavolt. Tesla superchargers are even faster. I hear so many people telling me different things that I've reached the halfway point on my quest to see what speed you actually charge at when you plug into any charger. And the results so far will shock you. I'm Dave, welcome to Dave Takes It On. Please subscribe and click the notification bell. I visit hundreds of chargers and I have no shame. I wander about and I video and I photograph everything I see. Happily wander up to chargers and take readings. Well, the results often astonish me. Why is one EV getting 150 kilowatt power while an almost identical car with the same maximum charging speed is only getting 30? And yes, I am obviously aware of the state of charge, the lower the battery, the faster the charge rate, but in these cases they're all at a very similar state of charge. So just what is different? I charge mainly at Tesla superchargers, and the majority of these have no screens. Even the V4s, which do have screens, do not show me, as a Tesla owner, the state of charge and the charging rate. It merely says, don't be silly, just check your app, as you always do. So when I go to a Tesla supercharger, I can't have any idea what rates other people are getting. So it's a bit of a revelation when I get to non-Tesla chargers because the details are all there on the screen for everyone to see and it makes fascinating viewing. Well the first observation there is little difference between charger brands. Now as an example last year I visited a Tesla V3 250 kilowatt charger an Instavolt 120 kilowatt charger and an Osprey Kempower 150 50 kilowatt chargers, all within an hour and all within about five mile of each other. And I arrived at each one without battery preconditioning at exactly the same state of charge, and the results were almost identical. Tesla just fractionally faster, but absolutely negligible in the real world. So yes, state of charge has a massive influence on every car and every charger brand. Once you get above 90%, the rate is ridiculously low for all EVs. And I've seen it here dropping to just 2 kilowatts. Well, think about that. At 97% state of charge and getting only 9 kilowatts power, the remaining 3% of an average battery will take another 15 to 20 minutes before it gets to 100%. At 99%, the remaining 1% could take 10 to 15 minutes at just 2 kilowatts power. So the total time for it to go from 10% to 100% in this instance is around 1 hour and 5 minutes. Yet that exact same car can charge from 10% to 80% in just 18 minutes. That extra 20% only gave around 50 miles of extra range, but it took an extra 47 minutes. Now, suppose the driver did charge to just 80%, but then stopped again in 100 miles and added that missing 20%. Well, that stop would have taken just 10 minutes. Well, let's call it 15 minutes by the time you've slowed down, got out, plugged in, then uh, plugged, unplugged and accelerated back up again. So total time would be 33 minutes for both stops. And that's almost twice as quick. Like Formula One, sometimes an extra pit stop gives you a quicker race time. OK, well, maybe the driver was taking a one hour lunch break and just left it plugged in while they were eating. Oh, that makes perfect sense. But far too many people are actually sitting in their cars, waiting for the charge to reach 100%, and that I find plain crazy. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please click the like button. It does make such a difference. OK, state of charge covered. Let's get back to other factors. 
Now all of the cars I observed for this video and took readings from had a maximum charging speed of at least 100 kilowatts. Some had a maximum speed of over 250 kilowatts, while many like the Tesla Model Y, Hyundai Ioniq 5 and the VW Buzz had at least 175. There were no Dasher Springs or Renault Zoe's or Nissan Leafs using Chademo at 50 kilowatts. And all the readings shown are for a state of charge of around 50% or less. Well, spoiler alert, none got anywhere near 200 kilowatts. Only a few broke the 100 kilowatt barrier and most were hovering around the 50 kilowatt mark. That was a surprise. So what can explain these readings? Well, my investigations are ongoing. This is a long term project and will eventually result in a huge database of all EVs I've encountered using all the EV charging networks and all the different brands and makes of chargers. But the first thing you absolutely must do is to use battery preconditioning every single time you charge. I suspect the main cause is batteries being too cold. See, all EVs have some form of preconditioning, while some have automatic activation when you program into SatNav an EV charger. Tesla states that battery preconditioning can reduce the charging time by as much as 25% on its own. Most EV drivers seriously underestimate its effectiveness, and far too many have no idea at all about preconditioning. I speak from experience having talked to dozens, probably now hundreds, of EV drivers. The ideal battery temperature for charging for most cars is usually around about 30 or 40 centigrade. Some are actually much higher. Driving normally has no real impact on your battery temperature, contrary to popular belief. So even in the summer, you could arrive with your battery 20 or 30 degrees C below optimum, and in the winter that could be 40 or 50 degrees centigrade. Your battery management system will only allow the battery to charge safely, so will throttle the charging speed if it's too cold. That's simple. But what we don't seem to appreciate is that the battery management system is throttling the charging rate to protect the battery. While it probably does no real notable long-term damage, if the BMS is throttling, it is first of all not a good practice, second, it's preventing you from charging faster than you could, and third, it's reducing the range you can drive. A battery at optimum temperature for charging is also at the optimum temperature for discharging. It is simply more efficient. So when you leave the charging station with a nice hot battery, it will be at its peak efficiency. It will give you more range. So why don't we use battery preconditioning? Everyone always complains about charging speed, waiting forever to finish charging. Does not using preconditioning make any sense at all? For over four years of charging, my Model S, I know for a fact that I only ever see the maximum rates after preconditioning. I also know that I program in the charger on every single journey, even if it's local, and even if I know exactly where the charger is, as I use it regularly. I've been to Trentham Gardens, Stoke-on-Trent, for example, probably a dozen times. I've filmed there every single time. I know it really well. Yet I will always program it into my route planner on every trip there, every single time. I often make the claim that I never wait for my EV to charge, and part of that is achieved by using preconditioning to get the fastest possible charging time every time. And the rest is down to only ever charging to the minimum required and only ever at a low state of charge. See, I much prefer to stop more often than sit waiting for it to charge to 100%. So let me give you a couple of examples. I did two recent journeys home to Preston, both in the winter. One was from Guildford in Surrey and one was for Chelmsford in Essex. Now, my Model S did not 
quite have the range to safely complete the nearly 250 mile journey. Possibly could have. Now in both cases I topped up to just 80% before setting off. Why not 100% you shout? There is absolutely no point sitting around waiting for my car to get to 100% as even if I got to 100% I would still need to stop. So all I did was a quick top up to 80%, took about 15 minutes and I set off. Now I could safely reach Stoke-on-Trent, Keel Services, maybe even Warrington. But instead I chose to stop at Rugby on the M6 coming back from Essex uh, and Warwick M6 northbound coming back from Surrey. In both cases I still had a very good state of charge left, possibly even enough just to get back without charging at all. So I only needed to add about 20 miles or 30 miles. In both cases the charge speed I was getting was over 300 miles an hour, the total charge time was less than 10 minutes and it allowed me a quick break, stretch my legs, toilet break, pick up a coffee. So literally I stopped, plugged in, had a pee, picked up a coffee, returned to the car and set off. No waiting whatsoever. And I arrived home on both occasions with little more than 10% remaining. Plugged it into my cheap overnight uh, rate for electricity in my home charger. And the car was back to its normal 75% state of charge the next morning. Total time for each journey was less than 25 minutes. Had I waited for it to charge up to 100% before I set off from Chelmsford or um, Essex, I'd have waited longer than that just for the first charge and still had to stop. Crazy. Now if you commute, this sort of thinking is probably never needed, don't worry about it. But if you do longer journeys, it takes but a few seconds. It's now second nature to me. But these few seconds planning in my mind the quickest route can save me sitting around waiting impatiently for an up, up to an hour for the state of charge to reach 100%. Thanks for watching, I'm Dave. Well, thanks very much for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, please click the like button. And if you'd like to see more, please subscribe and click the notification bell so we can notify you next time we launch a video. And a massive thank you to all our Patreon supporters. It is your support that enables us to go out and make these videos for you. So thank you very much for your contribution. I'm Dave.